Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14517 in the name of Johan Lamont on the National Strategy for Survivors of Childhood Abuse. Debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I now call on Joanne Lamont to speak and open the debate. Ms Lamont, you have seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is a privilege to open this debate and I would like to thank all those members who supported the motion and all of you who are here tonight um, to listen to the debate. And can I also welcome to the gallery members of the cross-party group on adult survivors of child sexual abuse and thank them and Bernardo's Scotland NSPCC and Children First for the briefings they provided. And can I particularly thank Margaret Mitchell, who is the convener of the group, for all the work she has done over a significant period of time to keep that group going. In the time I have, it is difficult to do justice to all of the many issues that are highlighted in the motion, but I would urge members to attend the meeting directly after this debate to hear more about the concerns and challenges that the groups have identified. But this is an opportunity to recognise the importance of the cross-party group on adult survivors of child sexual abuse and its role in the creation of a national strategy for supporting survivors and the establishment of Survivor Scotland. Today, with the opportunity of the 10th anniversary, to thank all those who were involved at the time, particularly survivors and those who worked with them. And may I include my friend and former MSP Marilyn Livingston, who at that time was pivotal in the work that she did as part of the group, making sure that this very important issue was addressed. And in marking this anniversary, we have the opportunity to, to address the concerns voiced by survivors, by those who attend the group and those who work with survivors, about the current effectiveness and the level and, and strategic direction of support and whether that matches up to the ambitions of 10 years ago. We have, of course, come a long way in this very difficult issue. As a young woman in the 70s, um, the age of my daughter is now, I had little awareness of the nature of the suffering of child sexual abuse, its prevalence, the abuse within institutions, churches, in schools, in boarding schools, where adults were in a position of trust and chose to betray it and within the homes of children by their own families. The celebrities of my youth are the men who now have found that their crimes against children have been exposed. And we are more aware now of that crime. There is more acknowledgement of it, but the test for us is whether there's more understanding of what we need to do to address it. As a young secondary school teacher in the late 70s and into the 80s, training did not refer to child sexual abuse. No guidance was given to me as a young woman about how to be aware of the possibility of abuse um, being suffered by children in my class. No information given about how or why to raise concerns. No information about children who were victims about how you might treat them. As a young political activist, I was only beginning to learn and understand from those brave men and women who began to insist that their abuse should be acknowledged, that its devastating impact should be understood. And then, critically, the understanding and recognition that that abuse was as much a matter for political debate and action as anything else. And that ch change politically, that recognition that government action at every level was required was something that, over time, was developed. So there was little talk, or there is more talk about it now. There is more acceptance of the grave injustice, that grave injustice continues. But we have to understand that we need to do more. The test is whether we continue to focus on needs. Survivors need more than acknowledgement. They need rather to be sure that, that we address the consequences for them throughout their lives. Ten years ago, the strategy outlined the need to raise awareness, increased awareness of the long-term consequences for physical and mental health, the importance of surviving support service and enhance the health and well-being of survivors, and to develop training skills for frontline workers. It was also recognised that it was important too that we tackle and identify the level of the abuse. Critically, we need to ensure that survivors are not just supported to address the medical consequences for them, but there is an understanding of the wide and diverse range of needs that they have and the importance of these being addressed too. So we need more education, we need prevention, we need protection, 
and we need understanding of important importance of support services. But the strategy also needs to be clear that it should offer justice and a clear recognition that child sexual abuse is a crime and justice for survivors must be pursued. The Cross Party is clear that all survivors should have support, that the abuse of power by those who betrayed the trust that was placed in them in care homes, within churches, in boarding schools, in institutional settings, should be placed firmly in the context of child abuse, where 80% of child sexual abuse happens within the home and within communities. For the one thing that is consistent in child sexual abuse is not the setting, it is the brutalising powerlessness of the child and the impact of that child throughout life. These are not competing needs. They all deserve justice. Now, we supported, many across the chamber supported the establishment of the inquiry into historic child sexual abuse in institutional settings. But the Minister will be aware of the concerns of groups like White Flower Alba and others about the narrowness of the remit, excluding consideration of survivors who still suffer today, but whose abuse happened too long ago to be investigated, and which may, in some circumstance, exclude the experience of one survivor, but include that of another, even when the perpetrator is the same, because the setting was different. I urge the Minister to listen carefully to these concerns and reflect on how maybe we address that in the remit. I would also urge the Minister to resist the narrowing of the government's focus in the way in which it supports survivors. There are genuine concerns amongst those at the very heart of this issue about the direction of Survivor Scotland in defining the criteria for funding. It cannot just be about medical recovery. It must be the journey through life where they are supported. Ten years ago, it was clear that it was not just about accessing health services, but support services developed in the voluntary setting sector, drawing on the lived experience of those who know best what this abuse means. I ask the Minister directly to confirm that he will examine the approach now manifesting itself in funding a medical model rather than that deeper, richer support that was identified before. In conclusion and in summary, I would urge the Scottish Government to recognise the, the pervasive nature of child sexual abuse in our society and the traumatising impact it has not just on a person's health. I further urge the Scottish Government to review the remit of the historic abuse inquiry to ensure that it gives comfort to those who are looking to it for justice. Look again and resist the model developing through Survivor Scotland and ensure that rich development of resources are available. And finally, I would urge the, the Minister on this, that in reflecting on the last 10 years, that the Minister now instructs the development of a refreshed and renewed national strategy. And if he does that, recognise the time has come now to, to address this again, he will find a cross-party group. He will find all those who give support to survivors. He will find survivors themselves, and he will find people in this chamber ready to help ensure that it's fit for purpose. Many thanks. I now call on Mike Russell to be followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate Joanne Lamont and the Cross Party Group on not only achieving this debate, but on the work that they have done over the last decade. Um, I think that the group has been exceptional in its, its actions, and I have no doubt whatsoever that the support, action, and even the inquiry must learn from the work that the group has done with survivors to ensure that they, those things are survivor-centred, survivor-led, and must be available to all. Those are basic principles which we cannot deny. And the reason for it being survivor-led, survivor-centred, and available to all is that there must be an outcome that allows survivors to move on from that definition, not just to be defined by those who have survived, but to be defined by people who wish to live and flourish after that experience. And I'm sure the Minister will reflect upon that, because it is the outcome that will be important. This has been a tense and difficult process in the establishment of both the inquiry and the support fund, and the cross-party group knows that better than most. Those people involved have often had, fully understandably, the most awful experiences that have destroyed 
their trust in government, in authority and indeed in fellow human beings. Therefore, it will not always go smoothly. As Joanne Lamont has indicated, this is a political issue and politics have entered into it and the slowness of the political process in recognising the injustices and acting on them is something we should all be ashamed of. But when we recognise those things, we have to find a way forward. And the way forward is goodwill, determination, courage and constant listening. Last year in this chamber on the 11th of November, when I was still Cabinet Secretary, I announced not only the government's acceptance of the outcomes of the insight process, but also the establishment of the fund, and that was confirmed by my successor in May at a total of 13.5 million over five years. But that was a mechanistic thing. Of more importance to me was the experience I had in understanding, as Joanne Lamont has said, over a period of time and progressively, the awful responsibility of society the way in which society had to uh, confront honestly what had taken place and help those who had survived those experiences to move forward. And the, the most important part for, for me was the insight process. In April this year, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, which was responsible for that process, made a submission to the Scottish Government about the inquiry. And it made two crucial points that we should bear in mind tonight. The first of which is calling on the Scottish Government to ensure that the panel principles are observed whenever this issue is considered. And those principles are participation, accountability, non-discrimination and equality, empowerment and legality. And every single thing that the Scottish Government does in this area should be underpinned by those principles. But there is a second point that the Human Rights Commission made which is of importance too. To ensure that work continues more widely for all survivors while the inquiry takes place, not to delay the process of helping those because focus is elsewhere. This has been a long, slow process. The national strategy, the cross-party group, it's paved the way for insight and the fund. It led to the inquiry, led to the action on time bar. It has led to the actual amount in the fund. But this is a, a process. It's not event-driven. And the process is to provide justice, to resort, restore trust, and to create a future for those who have been affected. And moreover, to ensure that it can never, ever happen again. I think this debate will help that process. But nothing, nothing will overcome the injustice that was done. But every fibre of our being as politicians working together, working with survivors, working with charities, every fibre of our being should be to do our best in this matter and to do it together. Many thanks. I now call on Graham Pearson to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. President, officer, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on tonight's debate. Uh, I open by congratulating Joanne Lamont on achieving this debate this evening uh, and acknowledging Margaret Mitchell's uh, convenership of the cross party group on the adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. The CPG and its supporters who are here in the chamber have, across the period of these 10 years, been extremely successful in maintaining a spotlight on the pressing issues, demanding the need for an effective strategy and policies to be implemented, a strategy supporting survivors, victims, their nearest and dearest. I would also acknowledge Mike Russell's courage in recognising the need to change last year and creating the context within which the government could change its approach to this issue and finally see the need for a public inquiry. The sexual abuse of any human being is repugnant. The circumstances of children suffering such abuse is particularly harrowing. And no one comes to this issue voluntarily, whether it's those who seek the help from politicians or indeed politicians who are drawn into these debates as they try and find a way of supporting survivors and victims. It's not often that Mike Russell and I would agree on much, but I have to say I agree with everything he's had to say this evening, and it saves me reiterating the words that, that he's uttered. I am grateful for the many briefings I have received before this debate 
and do note that progress has been main, uh, maintained in terms of developing a government strategy over these 10 years. But much yet has to be done, and there are concerns across the sector amongst survivors and victims regarding a commitment to funding the services and support that Mike, Mike Russell uh, made reference to. Survivors, their victims and families need support now. They need medical support, psychological support and on occasions financial support, as well as all the policy changes that we need to decide on in the months and years ahead. And we need to demonstrate a true commitment to these changes because survivors have too often been promised in the future only to be let down. Uh, White Flowers Alba have briefed repeatedly on the shortcomings that they have identified, and I know there are members of that group uh, in the Parliament today. INCAS also have contributed. Yes, the court service does note there are substantial increases in the number of court cases being handled and the accused who are being prosecuted in relation to sexual abuse, many of them historical in nature, but thereby sees a fresh demand for government support as more survivors come forward. And indeed, we know with the growth of the internet, the extent of that need eh, is in thousands, eh, not merely a few people here or there. The abuse of children as yet has not been answered in a way that survivors and victims would wish. Eh, I implore the minister to give a commitment to show a positive response to the needs of survivors and the demands that they make. They make them in good faith. They don't ask for much. And to listen and to engage with them is all the more important at this time in our development. Presiding officer, I'm grateful for that opportunity. And thank you very much, Mr Pearson. I um, now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, presiding officer. And I thank Joanne Lamont for using her Labour member's business time to bring this important motion for debate to the chamber. The Cross-Party Group on Adult Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse, the CPG, came into being following one of the first ever petitions lodged in the Scottish Parliament's Petitions Committee. And I pay tribute to the first convener, Marlon Livingstone, the members and co-conveners of the CPG, for all they have done to support survivors and to raise awareness about childhood sexual abuse and to focus on preventative measures for almost 16 years now. The National Strategy for Survivors of Childhood Abuse was the culmination of years of the hard work and persistence of primarily the CPG, together with the successor, successive former Health Ministers Malcolm Chisholm, Andy Kerr and then later Nicola Sturgeon. This was a groundbreaking initiative that represented a pioneering approach in the UK and further afield, which put in place a national plan for the preventing abuse, from preventing abuse from happening in the first place and to increase support for survivors of childhood abuse. Its aim was to address the situation which the strategy document sets out, whereby too many survivors report a revolving door experience, being moved from service to service without having their needs satisfactorily addressed. This in turn explains why the strategy took a trailblazing survivor-led approach. And the Survivor Scotland strategy achievements, as it celebrates its 10-year anniversary, are not inconsiderable, including the pooling of information online for easy access to resources and research, and the highlighting of the needs of both female and male survivors, as well as providing funding services and projects to support survivors and to carry out preventative work. However, 10 years on, and despite the success the strategy has during this time, there are now serious concerns regarding its future. For example, survivors of abuse often look for support services in their area, and in particular for services that offer trauma counselling, but there is still a lack of specialist trauma services available. 
with a shift of emphasis towards a medical model for determining our understanding of the needs of survivors, this lack of provision is clearly worrying. In addition to this, the Scottish Government proposed changes to the way the survivors will access support services has caused yet more concern. More specifically, survivors and supporter, uh, support services are dismayed that moving to a broker model where further emphasis, which further emphasises health care rather than a holistic approach, including social welfare, could potentially be a significant risk to survivors' well-being. At a time when child sexual abuse cases are hitting the headlines across the UK and the Prime Minister has prioritised childhood sexual abuse as a national threat on a par with serious organised crime, and with a Scottish public inquiry into historic child sexual abuse underway, there has been a worrying silence about the future of the national strategy. The CPG has therefore warned that, with the public inquiry and the focus on institutional abuse, the fact that the vast majority of child sexual abuse takes place within a family setting and in communities has been largely absent from the national conversation. Presiding officer, there are clearly many opportunities for a renewed strategy to further the progress of the last 10 years in supporting the courageous survivors who make the brave decision to disclose the abuse they have experienced. Consequently, the uncertainty surrounding both the future of the strategy and the changes to the provision of support services needs to be recognised and addressed as a matter of urgency. I hope this evening the Minister can give some much needed and deserved assurance and reassurance on this point. Thanks very much. I now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. I too, of course, uh, congratulate Joan, Joanne Lamont for securing uh, this debate and, of course, also congratulate the CPG, the Cross Party Group, for doing all, all the work they have done and uh, uh, support very much what uh, Margaret Mitchell was just saying. Childhoods, childhoods, childhood sexual abuse is a, a sobering reminder that our main prior priority should be to do our best to put in place protections uh, for people starting from as early a point as is possible in their lives. This means protecting, unfortunately, people from other people. Children are probably the most sensitive and vulnerable to abuse, physical, emotional and sexual, as they are unable to defend themselves, trapped in their own homes uh, too often. So our duty and responsibility is to make sure that the measures we put in place prevent abuse from happening. However, when these things do happen, our systems must be ready and able to respond appropriately uh, by always keeping the survivors in, in mind. I want to commend uh, the work of my children first in my own area, in Selkirk. Their work on keeping children safe and helping them res respond to their traumas is commendable, commendable in its ability to create a slightly safer place for people. And it's uh, the work on the survivors of sexual childhood abuse that they do. They are survivors travelling many miles uh, across the region uh, to come from uh, to take this, the services there. And that comes into question about are we actually providing enough service across the country. People are travelling two hours to Selkirk for that service. So I think we need to build services, hire staff perhaps, establish organisations that can provide support to people. And what's absolutely essential is the need for time and a focus on the individual, the survivor. Any experience of abuse that has taken place in a person's childhood will have long-term effects. In order for someone to come forward and be able to talk about his or her experience, they must have a good and trusting relationship with the person they are revealing their experiences to, their counsellor. I'm sure we all appreciate that these experiences are not taken lightly by anyone, even less by those who have lived through it. Allowing time for people to trust uh, that they will have all the support they need is a responsibility, not just for the government, but for all of us, and we must support that. But because of the nature of these experiences, many memories are buried deep and hidden away. And in order to access these painful memories, the person must be able to trust their counsellor or consultant. And that takes time through long-term consultations and often meetings that take a very long uh, time. And of course, one of the biggest obstacles to a healing process for a survivor is the ability to disclose. 
Uh, disclosing is not an easy thing for someone to come forward with, so I think we have to do more. As more people do come forward, we have to recognise that there are many that need a safer environment to disclose what has happened in the far past. So perhaps GPs need to uh, have a standard question when they have some of their standard meetings with uh, patients, uh, which may make it easier for survivors uh, to disclose. The Scottish Government's new service model for in-care survivors will become effective next April. Uh, the service seeks to put in place NHS-led services through using psychologists. Open secret notes that this new service will not itself have any counsellors working for it or provide therapy. Uh, with the current limited resources and psychological provision throughout the NHS, not only are there limited numbers of psychologists, but even less so psychologists were able to dedicate hours to a person. And that is exactly what abuse survivors need, time and dedication. So we need consultants with the ability to work with childhood, childhood abuse survivors in a long-term uh, relationship. Deputy Presiding Officer, ensuring time and adequate provision for survivors of uh, childhood abuse is something that the government must provide. Children will grow up to become adults, and these painful memories can prove to be damaging throughout life. It is our responsibility through the services the State can provide that any person at any stage in their lives anywhere in Scotland can come forward and know that they will be heard and that they will be helped. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Christine Graham. So, uh, thank uh, Joanne Lamont for introducing this very important uh, subject and paid tribute to her work in the cross-party group and indeed to the work of Margaret Mitchell. And I hope the government will pay very close attention to the speeches of both Joanne Lamont uh, and Margaret Mitchell uh, today, because I think they did encapsulate uh, many of the concerns of survivor groups uh, currently. Uh, they certainly know far more about it than I do, although I was involved in the early days, as uh, Margaret Mitchell referred to, and in particular set up the Short Life Working Group on the care needs of people who have survived childhood sexual abuse. And I think the report of that group actually still repays uh, reading uh, again today, as I did prior to this debate, because I think it does give the broad view that uh, we all want to see. But clearly, although that fed into the strategy, I think it was the cross-party group that was the main influence on the development of the strategy all those years ago. And so we should certainly celebrate the work they now do and the work that they have done. And of course, that leads us back to Marlene Livingstone, who was the uh, first convener, and we should uh, remember her today as well. Now, survivors groups have always been crucial uh, to uh, the strategy. And um, not just in terms of mutual support, but in terms of spreading information and understanding to professionals and service providers and the wider public. So it is very important that these groups are supported, uh, in the first instance, financially. In the motion today, Open Secret uh, is mentioned, but we know of other groups, uh, for example, the Kingdom Abuse Survivors Group. So I believe that they must be uh, supported, uh, these groups, and also that they must be involved in the implementation, the continuing implementation of the strategy, they should be uh, in leadership uh, roles uh, uh, as they have been in the past, and I hope that they will be in the future if they are not uh, adequately um, in that position uh, currently. Now, clearly, one of the fundamental demands here is justice. This is a crime we are dealing with not an illness, but clearly uh, survivors also need the chance <coughs> to confront their own um, experience with loving support around them. So all that is part of the holistic approach that uh, speakers have referred to already in the debate today. Now, the motion refers to the concerns of survivors groups. These have been referred to by Joanne Lamont and Margaret Mitchell. And I would also commend to the Minister the article by Sarah Nelson in the Herald today, because she has been very, very closely involved with work in this area uh, for many, many years. I first came across her uh, in relation to her report, Beyond Trauma, Mental Health Care Needs of Women Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse, which made a very big impression on me. Um, I think it was 2001 or sometime around uh, then. And she was pointing out the way in which psychiatric services routinely do not uh, 
uh, face up to and understand the mental health implications of what uh, some people have endured. So I would recommend that article in the Herald today. Of course, we all welcome the focus on historical abuse in institutional settings and the inquiry chaired by Susan O'Brien, although as Joanne Lamont uh, reminded us, there are concerns about the narrow, narrowness of the remit. But as um, Sarah Nelson and other speakers today have reminded us, 80 per cent of survivors are abused in the family or the community. So we need to have a holistic partnership approach to address their needs as well. And also the strategy has to focus on prevention, staff training and those wider agendas that have been uh, referred to. So there are concerns about a narrowing of focus uh, of the strategy now, uh, if, uh, and um, Sarah Nelson describes it in her article today in terms of uh, in, in a focus on individuals and their med on a medical model, and clearly we need to have a holistic approach which involves groups as well as individuals. So I, I think that article should be paid attention to by the government as well as the speeches from Joanne Lamont and Margaret Mitchell. She also raises the interesting question about where this is located within the Scottish Government, because this is something that I have found confusing recently, whether it's in uh, the education of young people or health, and no doubt justice has a role as well. So I think there are issues there, and she makes the interesting uh, uh, suggestion that it should be in equality, but th those are just things to reflect on. They are not the most important part of the debate uh, today, but they are uh, part of what should be considered. But in conclusion, um, clearly the um, historical abuse inquiry is very, very important, but the government must also make sure that its policy and, fun and funding uh, pays attention to the needs of the 80 per cent of survivors who were abused in the family uh, or the community, and crucially, let's involve these people in the implementation of the strategy, as was always intended from the start. Thanks. I now call on Christine Graham, after which we move the closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a preliminary looking at the motion, it is clear, as other members have said, that the majority of childhood sexual abuse takes place within the family or within the community. It is, as we know, not stranger danger, but someone known to the child, and regrettably, it's still happening today. I think, as Malcolm Chisholm has said, we don't know where this particular issue lands, but it lands across many portfolios. In the chamber, we have a Minister for Health, a former Cabinet Secretary for Education, and I myself, though a backbencher, a member of the Justice Committee, as is Margaret Mitchell, and I congratulate you on your work, which we know you bring to the Justice Committee on the cross-party group as also convener of it. And I want to focus on some of the things that we've done in legislation, because you talked about justice, and at the end of the day, it isn't, I don't think, just about supporting people. It is about getting justice and the day in court, and I hope successful prosecutions. Currently, we have enacted the Victims and Witnesses Act, which has tried very hard from the point when someone comes into a police station to not just the point when they're sitting in court giving evidence, not just to the point when we hope that they have the accused person is successfully prosecuted and sentenced, but after that, when they're in prison and then after released, whether temporarily, whether they're out on bail or whether they've finished their sentence, the victim is at the heart of the judicial process and is treated respectfully and is treated in a sensitive manner in these particular cases. And that I think, I think that the various agencies have moved a long way in that direction, whether it's in police training, in the training, in the legal profession, on the judiciary and beyond. That's something that the Parliament has brought forward. And again this week, enacting an EU directive which strengthens even further the support for witnesses and victims we have supported that through a statutory instrument through the government. And that gives even more support, which should be given and has long been missing in the judicial system. Sometimes the victim, as the prime witness in a case, was almost a bystander, was not told what was happening, was not engaged and not supported. That has now passed. And I hope we continue along that. So I felt in this debate it was important to bring that particular part to what must be, at the end, a resolution of sorts for victims of childhood sexual abuse and abuse of other sorts? Some kind of resolution to it. And finally, I want to speak about Margaret Mitchell's Apologies Bill, which again 
doesn't deal with any remedies in the sense of criminal or civil action, but at least allows an apology to be taken. I think the committee, as you know, is very sympathetic to it. The minister has moved, and I know that the, the propulsion for that has been your experience in chaining the cross-party group on childhood abuse. So I thought it important to say, let's not put this into silos. This crosses health, it crosses education, and it crosses into justice, it crosses into social justice. And therefore, I thought it important to put in the record that I don't see it in silos, and I don't think members of the parliament see this in silos. They see it as something relevant to many of our workings within the committees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we now move to the closing speech from the Minister, Mr Hepburn. Thank you. Uh, very much, uh, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking Joanne uh, Lamont for uh, bringing forward this uh, uh, the sensitive but important subject for uh, debate? Can I uh, thank all uh, members for their uh, thoughtful contributions this evening? Uh, can I also uh, thank uh, members who have been involved in the work of the Cross Party Group, Joanne Lamont and Margaret Mitchell, uh, preeminent uh, among them? Of course, there have been uh, others involved too over uh, the years. Uh, the uh, group, as uh, Michael Russell uh, set out, and indeed as the Motion sets out, uh, has played a, a prominent role uh, in developing the uh, national strategy uh, for survivors of childhood abuse, which has been instrumental in raising awareness uh, and uh, improving knowledge uh, of uh, abuse. Let me say I know that uh, previously we had been uh, due to have a meeting uh, between myself and the uh, office bearers of the Cross Party Group. I, I regret that, of course, I can't quite remember what the events were that uh, caused it to have to be uh, rearranged, but I'll be very happy to meet. Uh, any member of the cross-party group or indeed any member of this parliament to discuss any issues uh, around our approach uh, to this uh, area uh, should they want to uh, contact me uh, to uh, request such. Uh, since 2007, uh, President Officer, uh, £1.5 million has been invested in the uh, current in-care uh, survivor Scotland service and £9 million has been invested in the third and voluntary sector organisations providing a, a wide range of local services that support all survivors of uh, abuse uh, across Scotland. However, uh, since the uh, survivor strategy was launched 10 years ago, we know uh, more about the, uh, the complex health and uh, wider uh, social needs of survivors and services must be more responsive uh, to their individual needs. One size does not uh, fit all. We have also uh, more evidence about what services and interventions work well, enabling uh, survivors to thrive and uh, recover in all aspects of their uh, lives. Our, the recently published Strategic Outcomes Framework sets uh, our, to our vision. It builds on the legacy of the 2005 strategy and prioritises our actions to meet uh, survivors' uh, needs. These priorities, which I'm sure will be shared by us all, include uh, preventing child abuse, uh, enabling and educating uh, Scotland's public service workforce to be uh, trauma-informed, uh, and continuously uh, improving the wide range of local support services that provide uh, vital support to survivors every day. A recently published report by the NSPCC reveals that one in eight children will report abuse. But we already know that the shocking statistic is that one in four children is the victim of abuse. Preventing abuse is therefore a priority for this government. Achieving this will require professionals across all sectors working together to identify and protect our most vulnerable children from abuse and the devastating impact it has, regardless of where it has taken place. A, a national training framework led by NHS Education Scotland will support this uh, work, ensuring a strategic and consistent standard of training for all who need it across all sectors that provide uh, vital support to survivors. Uh, protecting children from abuse is, however, a, a duty shared amongst us all as a society, and the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Education and Lifelong Learning has made clear that she is committed to improvement in child protection, and will make a statement to Parliament early in the new year. Uh, the recent launch of the e-learning resource, developed in partnership with Rosny, uh, the Scottish Government and uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, is a, a real example of how organisations are working uh, in partnership to share their expertise and knowledge on this important issue. This is a, a free online resource that will raise awareness and help build the skills and knowledge our workforce needs uh, to support survivors. I'm uh, very grateful to these uh, service providers throughout Scotland and the statutory voluntary and uh, third sector, the Moira Anderson Foundation in Airdrie, rape crisis uh, working right across the country, the specialist trauma centres in Lothian and Glasgow are just a few of the organisations that provide a valuable range of services 
to survivors of childhood abuse, regardless of where that abuse took place uh, and how long ago. Uh, briefly, Mr Hume. Jim Hume. Hume. Uh, thank the Minister for taking in, in intervention. Uh, it's fantastic he to hear all the, the, the news of uh, all what's going on, but does the Minister recognise the, the need for uh, not just uh, survivors to be able to disclose easily, but also the need for a, a long-term relationship with the, the councillors? Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I, I know Mr Hume raised this point in his uh, opening remarks, and I'm just coming uh, to uh, that, so I will come to that uh, in a minute. What I would I see the services I have just uh, mentioned are vital in helping uh, survivors across the range of support that they so desperately need. And uh, that is why, in the last few days, 20 uh, organisations have been notified they have been successful uh, in securing funding of almost uh, £1 million uh, for innovative partnership projects. I will be happy to provide details to any uh, member who wants them. Uh, they represent a range of organisations, and I hope they will uh, demonstrate their approach is not uh, entirely health-based or a so-called uh, medical model, but that does bring me to the point that Mr Hume uh, mentioned, because of course there is a role for uh, our National Health Service. He rightly identifies some of the challenges we face in mental health services right now, and I would uh, recognise uh, myself that we have uh, those challenges. Of course, uh, in responding to those challenges, we have invested an additional £100 million over the coming uh, five years into uh, mental health uh, services. We have seen uh, more people uh, treated through the uh, services we provide, but I recognise we have to do more. And uh, that £100 million will uh, bring forward a range of services that will offer improvements, including, I believe, in the area that Mr Hume uh, touched on a, a moment ago. Uh, also, we must uh, not forget that uh, without the dedication and bravery of survivors who have spoken out about their own experiences and campaigned relentlessly to have their voices heard, progress uh, to date could not have been made. Graeme Pearson urged me to uh, listen to voices of survivors. Uh, of course, I uh, give him uh, that assurance. Of course, we will always uh, listen and look uh, to respond. Uh, in that regard, uh, there has been uh, some comments about uh, the nature and the scope of uh, the inquiry. Uh, of course, the original call for the inquiry was for in care. Uh, uh, an in care inquiry. There was, of course, a call to uh, extend. We would listened to those calls, and the inquiry has gone beyond. Uh, just institutional care to include foster care and other forms of residential care, such as independent residential uh, schools. What I would say here is, of course, we should always do well to remember uh, that survivors do not always speak with one uh, uniform voice. There are different uh, points of view amongst survivors themselves, uh, and there are a range of views on the remit of uh, the uh, inquiry and, indeed, all uh, the matters we discuss uh, today. And the remit aims to strike a balance to seek truth and address failings, but to report in a timescale that is meaningful and acceptable uh, to survivors. And, of course, decisions going forward are for the chair of the uh, inquiry. Uh, I see him uh, coming up against uh, time, uh, President Officer, so let me move to the, uh, the uh, final area that I wanted to touch on in terms of uh, where we go forward in terms of uh, our funding to support survivors. Over the past year, there has been extensive engagement with survivors and the organisations that support them. Uh, this has allowed the Scottish Government to take stock of how far we have come and given us the opportunity to hear survivors' views about the things that uh, matter to them. In May, we announced an investment of £13.5 million over five years to uh, expand and enhance the current model of support for survivors of in-care uh, childhood abuse. Mike Russell was absolutely right to talk about the need to focus on outcomes for survivors. That is our approach. The support fund is designed around the uh, personal aspirations and outcomes that survivors uh, wish to see. The, uh, the fund will enhance and expand the current range of services to give survivors access to the information, resources and support that is important to them in meeting their individual, psychological, physical, social, education, employment and housing needs. And having listed that uh, area, I would say, that's why I would say this is not a medical model of support. This is not an entirely health-based uh, model of support, one which recognises the uh, needs of individual survivors. It will be different and very specific to them as individuals to have time, of course. I recognise you're coming to the end of your speech, Minister, and I wonder if you'd um, address the, the strategy and its future and its future funding specifically. Uh, well, of course, um, uh, I uh, would be happy to uh, discuss that further, I think, with uh, the uh, cross-party uh, group of We have made a significant uh, commitment in terms of uh, our support to survivors. That is a significant increase that I, in funding that I have just uh, set out. Uh, but um, I, why do I commit to a uh, meeting, uh, Ms Mitchell, uh, to discuss that uh, further? I would be very happy to do it. I think that would be a, a way that we could move uh, this uh, matter forward. Let me say, in conclusion, uh, President Officer, the vision of this 
uh, government is that survivors should have equal access to uh, integrated care, support and treatment uh, resources and services to reduce uh, the impact of the inequalities and disadvantages survivors have experienced as a result of abuse. That is why we will continue to develop and invest in capacity and capability of current services. That is why we will support new approaches of integrating individual needs based and outcome focused support and care that enables survivors to achieve their own out uh, personal outcome goals. Survivors have told us that is what they want and presenting officer that is what we will seek to deliver. Many thanks and many thanks to you all for taking part in this important debate. I now close this meeting of Parliament.